Hello, gentlemen. Welcome to Chapter 2, called Atoms, Molecules, and Ions. Our first section in Chapter 2 is dealing with the atomic theory of matter. Now, one of the great thinkers on the atomic theory of matter is Democritus. Now, Democritus, it's rumored that back in his time, one day he was just grinding up some spices in mortal and with a mortal mortar and pestle. And he was thinking to himself, well, can I smash this up so infinitely small that I can no longer smash it up again. He was the first one to think about something that small that has been recorded, of course. So he started describing the world as being made up of tiny indivisible particles called atomos, meaning indivisible. His theory was that the world was made up of these indivisible particles. He didn't use the word particles, but now he would. But shortly after he made this discovery or this you know, this statement, not shortly, but a while after he made it, greater thinkers, like Plato and Aristotle, they refuted this, they refuted this idea, and since they were greater thinkers of the time, Dem Democritus' theory was set aside. But, centuries later, the notion of atoms reemerged, and that was in the 17th century. As chemical reactivity became very popular, a man named John Dalton link the idea of elements with the idea of atoms. We knew them separately, but John Dalton said, well, what about Democritus' you know, idea? Can that be a part of what we know about elements? So John Dalton had some postulates, or just different parts of a theory. So his theory was broken down to four postulates. The first one, says so that each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. His second postulate was that all atoms of a given element are identical, but atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. Third, atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. Atoms are neither created or destroyed in chemical reactions. This last underlying part made way for a law, a law called the law of the conservation of mass. It says that matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. It can only be rearranged. So the atoms you have before and after in a chemical reaction have to be consistent. You can't just make atoms appear out of thin air in a chemical reaction or have atoms disappear. They just simply get rearranged into something new. The fourth postulate says that compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combine. We know that. And a given compound always has the same relative number and kinds of atoms. For example, let's take water. Water is always H2O. Two hydrogen atoms for one oxygen atom. Water will never be H3O, H4O2, H2O2, or HO2 or even just HO. Water, as we know it, and forever will, will be H2O. Nothing else. Now, this last statement brings about another law. The law of constant composition, or it's oftentimes called the law of definite proportions. This means that any given compound will have its own specific formula, its own specific ratio of atoms. In this case, water is two hydrogen, one oxygen. Water's formula will not change. Now, when two elements, H and O, can combine to make different compounds, we get something called the law of multiple proportions. It essentially states that when two elements can come together and make multiple compounds, these compounds, let's say, for example, H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, the stuff you put on your cuts when, you know, you get a scrape. This is also made of hydrogen and oxygen, just like water. But they have different ratios and different proportions, as you can see. The law of multiple proportions says that each compound will have their own set of unique whole number ratios. Two hydrogens to two oxygens two hydrogens to one oxygen. They will have their own unique set of 
whole number, small ratios. Now, let's switch it up and as you know, technology advanced, we started to learn more about atomic structure. So scientists became more knowledgeable and the supposedly indivisible atom began to show signs of a more complex structure. And today we know that the atom is composed of subatomic particles. Sub means within, atomic refers to atoms, so particles within the atom. Now we've learned of the particles in the atom through three major experiments. There are some other ones there, but these are the big three. The first one is the cathode ray experiment that helped determine what an electron was. This was done by J.J. Thompson. The second experiment was the Millikan oil drop experiment done by Robert Millikan. The third experiment was the gold foil experiment done by Ernest Rutherford. Next class we'll go through how these experiments were laid out, what was the procedure, what were the findings. These big experiments were based on these particular foundational you know, landmarks here. First, we knew that the atom was composed in part, or is composed in part, of electrically charged particles. Some of these particles are positively charged, some are negatively charged. And lastly, we know that like charges repel one another. Unlike charges, opposite charges attract each other. So gentlemen, take notes on these and come prepared to talk about some of the particulars here and we will build off of these three experiments and talk about what they actually were.